So I am Mohammed Darab, and this session we're going to be talking about big data clusters for the absolute beginner. Uh, big data clusters is fairly new technology with SQLs over 2019. You've probably heard about it. Uh, so this session, by the end of the session, you should have a good understanding of what it is, and more importantly, a passion to dive deep into it. So let's get started. First of all, I just wanted to also thank the Light Up uh, Virtual Conference for even having me to talk about this event. It's, it's just an amazing opportunity to raise money for a good cause. So if you have not already, uh, uh, definitely go ahead and do that as much as you can, as much as you comfortably can. So let me give a shout out to the sponsors of this event. Some of these uh, companies pulling off this, uh, uh, sponsoring this event, 24 hours of straight content. And then where I'm at, I'm in the DC area. It's 11 p.m. My kids and wife are asleep. I told them, you know, I got to rearrange the office so I can actually talk at a normal uh, audio level and not whisper this entire thing. So that being said, one thing I do want to say is if you are watching this live or maybe uh, later on, you can find everything right there. MohammedDarab.com forward slash BDC or Big Data Cluster, and you'll see everything there. This session, uh, a learning path, videos, blog posts, everything that I've done with big data clusters over the past year and a half, two years, you will find at that link right there. So, uh, by the way, if you do have any questions about big data clusters, go ahead and ask them and I will answer them as they come in or just keep it for the end. Uh, so let's get started with the abstract. Now, I'm a DBA by trade. That's the majority of my uh, work with SQL Server. And again, I am from the DC area, so a lot of the companies I've worked with are government uh, uh, contractors. They work with government, they work with outdated technology. And someone who's been working in that environment for a long time, I started to feel a little bit irrelevant. My skills started to become uh, outdated, working with SQL Server 2008, 2008 or two, only even a couple years ago. So what type of presentation can I do? What type of talk, what type of technology can I dive into that'll make me feel relevant again? Updated, so to speak, just like we update our computer software, we wanna also update our mind and our tech skills to stay relevant, not only for today, but years to come. And I found that to be personally big data clusters. So hopefully at the end of this, you will feel uh, passionate and excited at, as I am to pursue big data clusters. So a little bit more about myself. Again, like I said, I'm from the DC area. 20 years working with IT. I started in the year 2000. Uh, a little over 10 years of that working with SQL Server. As of uh, this month, July 1st, I was uh, awarded the Microsoft uh, MVP for the data platform category. I'm honored uh, to have that. Uh, last year, I was an IDERA ACE for class of 2019. And online, again, MohammedDarab.com. I blog heavily on that site. You can reach me there, contact, etc. And if you're on Twitter, reach out to me at mwdorab. You'll see that right there as well. So let's talk a little bit about the agenda here. I'm going to go over the history. What is a BDC? Some architecture. So I give you an overview of the architecture, some features, licensing and cost. And I'll leave you with a learning path. So when you're done with this video, you have somewhere to go and something to do uh, re related to big data clusters in your pursuit of understanding that, not just another session where you leave and you kind of forget about it. Hopefully I leave you with something to do. And more importantly, there's a surprise at the end. So if you hang with me today, no matter where you are in the world or maybe watching this later, maybe if you're watching it later, you can probably fast forward to the end, but uh, there's a surprise for those live viewers. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's start with the history. Let's go back to 2016 when SQL Server introduced a feature called Polybase. Now, if you have not heard of Polybase, all this allowed the DBA or database professional to do was sit at your SSMS, SQL Server Management Studio, connect to uh, Hortonworks or Cloudera, a Hadoop service, and select data from it. You can you can join data from Hadoop or this big data and join it with your relational data, your T-SQL, your data, the relational data sitting in your SQL server. You didn't have to 
learn a different language. You didn't have to do anything regular T-SQL. All the translation was happening as part of the Polybase engine in, a, in the background. So that's what came out in 2016. Now at the time, uh, around 2015, I remember going to a user group and, and, and listening to the new features of SQL Server 2016. And I, at the time 2015 i was working with sql server 2005 2008 so this was cool i understood polybase conceptually but i never i haven't in fact when i asked people who's actually implemented to polybase even today not that many hands go up so it's a feature that i understood it conceptually never really had to do anything with it and life goes on in 2017 this was a big shift or uh, as they say a paradigm shift with sql server when they supported the same SQL Server engine on Linux. So now you can actually deploy SQL Server on Linux, Red Hat, Ubuntu, etc. Now, as a result of SQL Server running on Linux, you can also run SQL Server, an instance of SQL Server, on a container running on Linux. Now, if you, if you don't know what a container is, don't worry about it. It took me a while to understand that conceptually. In a couple more slides, we're going to, you know, a little dive into what, what that is. But just understand that a container is more of a Linux technology. And since you're running SQL Server on Linux as the operating system, they also were allowed to run it on a container. Now, I remember when I first read about this, SQL Server uh, being supported on Linux, the big question I had, and maybe you all ha had a, the same question, was why? Why would Microsoft spent so much money to support SQL Server on Linux. Who would even do that? I just associate SQL Server with Windows and that's it. But as they say, hindsight is 2020. And as we go along these slides, you will start to see why. So that was 2017. Now in 2019, they had this feature called Enhanced Polybase. Now, what does that mean? Now, if you remember in 2016, they had the regular polybase, enhanced polybase. Let's look at this image over here. You see Cloudera and Hortonworks. That was the same old from 2016. Now they integrated the Spark engine. Now, in terms of relational databases, you can connect from your SQL server to another, not only to another SQL server, but Teradata and Oracle. Now, that really drew my attention that you can actually sit from a SQL Server database and connect over via this enhanced polybase and select data from an Oracle server or a Teradata server and join that with your SQL Server. That was very, very interesting. Uh, moving over to the left, you can see NoSQL, MongoDB, Azure Cosmos DB, and then your ODBC connections. So this enhanced polybase, all it means is they added more connectors. So not only your Hortonworks, Cloudera, but Spark, Oracle, Teradata, they added all these connectors and in the future more connectors will be built into it, but that's what they mean enhanced polybase as of 2019. One other thing to note is in 2019, you can actually deploy availability groups on Kubernetes. So if you're familiar with availability groups, then you get somewhat of the idea, but if you're not, that's fine. Kubernetes, we'll talk about that in a couple more slides if you don't know what that is. So usually when I give this talk and I and I talk about polybase and polybase and polybase, people ask one question. <laughs> and that is, what's the difference between polybase and link servers? Right there. Link servers is instance scope, polybase is database scope. Polybase is more for analytic uh, queries, returning large number of rows. Link servers is more just for a couple rows coming back, OLTP. Now, the funny thing is, whenever I ask the crowd, how many people have worked with link servers? A lot of hands go up. It's an older technology, it's been around forever, and a lot of people use it. Then I ask, how many of those people love working with link servers and the hands go down? It's a pain in the butt sometimes to troubleshoot in places that I've worked. I've seen people use link servers for everything that you probably see on the polybase side. I mean, mainly the analytic queries of processing large number of rows. And then you get a lot of connection errors and issues and it's hard to troubleshoot. So link servers has has their uh, their downside. I, honestly, I've not come across somebody who's said good things about link servers. So 
Now, I did mention uh, towards uh, the beginning in, ter in terms of 2017, SQL Server was uh, supported on Linux, and as a result, also containers. Now, what is a container? A container is pretty much a standard or logical unit of software that has everything that it needs to run an application or a service. So for example, uh, the SQL Server image file that Microsoft has in a, public, in, a, in a public repository has everything needed that when you were to instantiate that, it runs fine, you don't need anything else. So that running or that instantiation is a container. Now a container is lightweight in the sense that you can deploy a container fairly quickly of let's say of a SQL Server instance and deploy multiple containers, hundreds of containers on one machine, on one VM or one physical machine. You don't have to you know, deploy a whole new server up, install the OS, install SQL Server. You don't have to. If you have your base OS, let's say Linux, then you can actually just with a command create one instance of SQL Server running on container one and then another instance on container two and then let's say your developers need access to container two, you give them that access. Uh, another group of developers, another individual needs access to container one, you give them that. And it's separated up. It, it, the technology really divides up the networking, the CPU, the storage, or the memory perfectly, but uses the same OS, which is very lightweight and fast to deploy and destroy. So. Now, containers are cool. It took me a while to understand, you know, well, what does a container do and why would anybody need it, especially uh, from a database standpoint. But the real beauty about containers is when you incorporate some type of container orchestration, some type of intelligence or quote unquote power to come in and scale out or scale up, scale down, uh, if a container was to die, for example, to create a new one, that is Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is the quote unquote container orchestrator, for lack of a better better term, pretty much in charge of scaling, scaling um, and mainly meant to automate a lot of this stuff where and we'll talk about it in a couple more slides that really doesn't need that much human intervention. Once you set it up, according to however your business logic is, you kind of sit back and just watch it do its beauty. And that's the beautiful thing about Kubernetes. So we'll talk about uh, the next couple slides are about Kubernetes. So if you have any questions, hopefully the next couple slides will shed light on that. So everything within Kubernetes, whenever somebody says Kubernetes, Kubernetes, they're really talking about Kubernetes cluster. Everything happens within the context of a master node and these worker nodes. The master nodes tells the worker nodes what to do, monitors the health, is in control of scaling up, scaling down. You really need a cluster. Otherwise, it's just nothing really. So if you look at this image right here, you have this master node and you have these worker nodes right around it. Now these machines are called nodes, this is regular naming convention. They call them nodes. The master node, again, like I mentioned, controls the clusters, like the brains of the cluster, and the rest are worker nodes, pretty much uh, just like any other type of, you know, if you have your, uh, uh, I guess you can say AG availability of your primary, you have your secondary, I mean, not exactly like that, but you have your uh, primary and you have your secondary. Similarly, you have your master and you have your worker nodes, the master divvies out the, distributes the work, uh, work between the worker nodes, etc. Now, when I mention a node, a node, runs these applications, these containers, but it can be run on either a physical machine or a virtual machine. So if you have, let's say if you want a, you know, five node Kubernetes cluster, you can have five for physical machines, but ideally, I guess, depending on, on, on ease, uh, would be ideal to go virtual route with VMs. But again, a node, when somebody mentions a node in a Kubernetes cluster, they're talking about physical machine or virtual machine. Now, one thing I wanna kind of adjust a little bit is when I mentioned a container, Kubernetes takes a container, what really happens is Kubernetes uses this unit called a pod, which you see right there, the second point right there, pod, 
which is a logical group of one or more containers and associated resources. A pod runs on a node, and a node can run one or more pods. Now, this might seem a little confusing, but don't worry, the next image uh, that I created will hopefully shed more light on that. But just understand this. If you have uh, a container, and I like to always use my fist. If you have a container and inside the container, you're running SQL Server, an instance of SQL Server. Now, how, how does Kubernetes control that container? It doesn't really communicate directly with the container and it can't. What it does is it creates a pod and the pod wraps the container and then these Kubernetes, uh, the master, will talk to the pod itself. So the pod does all of the internal communication to the container, but Kubernetes from the master point of view talks to the pod. So hopefully that makes sense. The next slide will shed more light. Let's let's uh, move on. So this image right here, I, I uh, so eloquently designed for you uh, with my infinite artistic, artistic skills. But starting from the left side, you see this is the image file. So this is that file, let's say SQL Server image file that Microsoft has in its public repository. You download this file, you instantiate it, it becomes a container. Now this container what can be placed on a pod and that's what Kubernetes does and that's what these blue shapes are for. That's where Kubernetes comes in and it takes these containers and it puts it on a pod. You can have multiple containers in a single pod. Now you can take this one pod, you can have multiple of them on a worker node, which is again a physical machine or a virtual machine. So you can have multiple pods running multiple containers in a worker node. Now these worker nodes, you join them up and you create a Kubernetes cluster. You have your master node, and then you have your worker nodes. A couple things I want to say here, two things actually. Number one is if you start again from the left, this image file, the SQL Server image file, the rule is you can only have one image per one container. So one image, one container, one to one. You can't have two image files, let's say SQL Server and uh, Hadoop, running in one container. You have to break them up, which brings me to the second point. If you see here, you have three different containers and three different services. You have Spark, Hadoop, and SQL Server. Now you might ask, well, in what scenario would, can't I have one container per pod? Which you can, actually, I absolutely can do that. The one thing is, if you are running two services that in a way need each other, are codependent on each other, then you can place those on the same pod. I'll give you an example. If you have SQL Server running on one, con uh, one uh, pod, uh, one container, sorry, but you also have a metrics collection agent running. And the purpose of this metri metrics collection agent is you install it as a little service running and all it does is it's sending metrics to a database. That's all. Now then you have some front end web app or whatever that connects to it and you can see metrics of that pod. Now that metrics is collected only on the pod that's running the SQL Server. You want to know how the SQL Server is running. So if that pod was to die, then you don't care if the metrics container on top of also the SQL Server, they both die because they, they go hand in hand. But if, for example, if you had your database application, let's say SQL Server in a, in a container, but you also had your front end application in the same pod, you really don't want to do that because if one pod goes down, then everything goes down. You want to divide it up. So planning is very, very important when it comes to uh, distribution of pods and what, you know, what, what uh, containers you want on what pods and what pods you want on what uh, worker nodes. So hopefully that made sense. Again, if you have any questions, uh, just feel free to ask and uh, let's move on. So all this and why? All this Polybase and Linux and containers and Kubernetes, but the question is why? Why did Microsoft do this? I want to share a couple pieces of statistic with you all that when I was putting this presentation together, really blew my mind. And it really put things into perspective a little bit about how much really is being generated out there, how much data is being generated out there. So let's start with the first one. 
data never sleeps. 90% of all data today was generated in the last two years, 90%. Usually when I ask the uh, crowd, I say, what do you think is producing this 90%? And the overwhelming answer I get is social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all these type of social media platforms are generating so much data but then what's really happening with this data? I want to share another piece of statistic with you all that this also even blew my mind more than this one did. Give you a second to, to read that. Now you might be in a part of a world that you probably have not heard of Walmart or um, you don't have a Walmart, but I can assure you that if you have uh, some type of company equivalent in your country, there's some type of data collection going on. But just specifically, Walmart collects 2.5 petabytes of data from 1 million customers every single hour. Every single hour. Billions of Facebook messages, Instagram, Twitter, whatever, you name it, they collect it. You might be wondering, what the heck do they need all this data for? Well, I'll give you a, I'll give you, I'll give you a two quick uh, facts, actually three. <laughs> One is Walmart went from a 12 node Hadoop cluster in 2012, 12 node, or I think it was a 10 node, to a 250 node Hadoop cluster in 2012. Now imagine what's happening in 2020, put things into perspective. Walmart also has data on over 160 million people. I mean, that's ridiculous, but that's what they do, they collect. One more piece I'll share with you is, Walmart found out during the analysis of all this big data that there are certain spikes of a certain product during a certain time in Florida, specifically during a hurricane season in Florida spikes of strawberry pop tarts would go up seven times. So you would have one X, one X, one X, all of a sudden seven X during a specific time, and then it would go back down to one X. This really intrigued, obviously the people at Walmart and decision makers, and they said, well, we wanna find out why, what's really happening? They found out in Florida, whenever there's a hurricane, people go buy strawberry pop tarts from Walmart to the effect of 7x. So what does Walmart do with this information? They push strawberry pop tarts front and center whenever there's a hurricane. So Walmart took this data, analyzed it, turned it into something actionable and want to maximize profits. That's what, all what it comes down to. And I like to, in a joke, jocular way, say it's all about the ching ching. It's all about saving money, it's all about making money. So this ne next uh, quote is from the Walmart CEO back in 2013. I'll give you a second to check that out, but pretty much Walmart CEO in 2013 said, we want to know what every product in the world is. We want to know who every person in the world is, and we want to have the ability to connect them together in a transaction. That's eerie. I mean, that's not just saying he wants to do good with business. He wants to, you know, uh, make sales. He wants to know what every product is, who every, what every, you know, who every person is, and also connect them in a transaction all around the world. So yeah, you watching this, listening to this, you. He wants to know what you want to buy, and he wants to put you. Next time you walk into a Walmart, again, if there's a Walmart in your area, your phone might go off with a coupon with something that most likely you're gonna buy. But anyway, that's just what big data is. You might be working with a company that doesn't deal with big data, but just know the fact that big data is just astronomically getting bigger and bigger and bigger, more and more and more. So what does SQL Server have to do with this? SQL Server comes through and says, hey, for the past 25 years, I've been a relational database engine, but guess what? 2019, the game's changed now. There's a big new SQL Server coming in the game, and it's called big data clusters. Pick me, I can do everything. I can, 
I can analyze it, Spark, Hadoop, T-SQL, whatever it is, relational, non-relational. I can do it all in-house with SQL Server 2019 with big data clusters. So what is big data clusters? Let's talk about that. This is a definition from the Microsoft documentation site. I'll read through this for you. BDCs allow you to deploy scalable clusters. Now that's scalable is that Kubernetes with the containers, being able to scale and scale and scale out of SQL Server, Spark, and HDFS containers running on Kubernetes. These components are running side by side to enable you to read and write and process big data from T-SQL or Spark, allowing you to easily combine and analyze your high value relational data with your high volume big data. Now, similar to how T-SQL, we use T-SQL to get data, right? Extract data out from a SQL Server database engine. Spark, on the other hand, was developed to analyze and get data from Hadoop, from HDFS or the Hadoop distributed file system. Spark is that engine. So that's why you have it right there, big data from T-SQL or Spark. They kind of relate those together. So this really turns SQL Server 2019 into complete game-changing next level uh, product. I mean, it really turns SQL Server into an entire artificial intelligence machine learning platform, not just your database engine anymore. This isn't just, you know, you can have SSRS and SSIS and SQL Server. Oh, cool, I got my BI tools, I got my reporting and all that. This is goes, this is way beyond that. You can stream in data. Let's start from the, all of this, by the way, is SQL Server 2019, it's amazing. You can start from the left side, which are unstructured, whether you have IoT devices, SQL Server Edge, anything coming in, whether it's Spark Streaming, Kafka. Kafka is very popular, uh, originally developed by LinkedIn. They had to figure out how to scale fast uh, and they developed Kafka and your structured data coming in, you store it in your SQL Server or your Hadoop, all within SQL Server. We'll talk about that in a couple more slides. Then your smart people come in, your Spark, your Spark uh, machine learning, your, your machine learning services come in and they're doing all their algorithms, their analysis, and they're trying to make sense of this big data. They're trying to turn it into information. You can use it, you know, uh, make it actionable. That's what they come in and do. They model and serve it. Then you got your BI tools like Power BI, et cetera, coming in and, and doing it. So all this is within SQL Server big data clusters. Now, one thing I want to say before we get into the architecture is if you are uh, new to SQL Server or you are a DBA, you don't have to learn every single one of these uh, uh, shapes, like a, a Kafka, a Spark Stream. It'll be good. But as a DBA like myself, I don't know anything about machine learning. I'm not a machine. I'm, I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, a data scientist. I'm, that's not me. I'm starting to learn about this. Um, and one thing I, I want to stress is as you're learning about SQL Server big data clusters, we never lose our sweat equity. I've been working with SQL Server for 10 years. I don't lose it. I don't start from scratch. I build on top of whatever I know in terms of SQL Server. So don't get discouraged with how uh, uh, complicated these things might seem, even though the learning curve is steep, but I just want to assure you it's doable. So let's get into the architecture. Now, big data cluster architecture from a bird's eye view, so to speak, is pretty much what you see here. This image was taken from the Microsoft documentation site. Uh, all I did here was I Bo I bolded the green, the black, and the red. So the green is the actual big data cluster. Inside of that are these, uh, the black would be the pools. And I, I can't stress enough. These terms like, you know, compute pool, storage pool, data pool, they're just logical unit of life services. That's it, nothing big, nothing complicated. These uh, red are pods. Inside the pods are, let's say, in the compute pool instance are SQL compute instances. So all they do is, you probably already guessed it, they do computation. That's it. They don't do anything else. The storage pool here, these are only SQL Server in, uh, pods that handle uh, HDFS, Spark, and SQL Server running together. The data pool, caching, persistent. We'll talk about that in a couple more slides. The main thing I want to bring your attention to is right here, the SQL Server master instance. So that means 
when you deploy a big data cluster, it does take some time. You deploy it and you're going to have some trouble deploying it and learning curve and this and that. But once you get it deployed, the SQL Server master instance is pretty much what you connect to. SSMS, uh, Azure Data Studio, if you connect to it, your custom apps, your BI, your anybody needs a connection string, anything like that. They get the endpoint of the SQL Server master instance. In a couple more slides, I'll show you a screenshot of how that looks. But just know that as a DBA professional or database professional, SQL Server master instance, the majority of the complexities of the big data cluster has been abstracted away from you, so you don't really see it. You have to go in to look for it, but um, which is great because initially it's not as overwhelming or overwhelmingly confusing. So. One thing I want to note is this you see you might see like what the heck is this controller doing out here? This actually is part of the big data cluster. Uh, it's just out here because it just didn't fit within this uh, this context right here. So let's talk about the, the controller. What is the controller? The controller hosts the core logic of the big data cluster. When you deploy the control, when you deploy a big data cluster, which by the way, I do have blog posts and videos on how to do that. The first thing that's built is the controller and the controller then takes care of everything else all the other components the pools all that you'll see is done from the controller but the controller is built first the controller uh, interacts with kubernetes sql server instances it has a lot of these open source tools built inside for absolutely free like kibana and grafana if you're not familiar with these tools they're open source kibana is for log logging and Grafana is for metrics collection. So these come free. You just you get an endpoint, you click on it, which I'll show you in a couple more slides, and then you uh, you just view a wealth of information for free, absolutely free. So, like I mentioned, the controllers uh, manage the cluster lifecycle, bootstrap, delete, update, etc. Uh, it manages a master instance, all different uh, pools, and also the cluster security. Now, I usually ask how many people have Azure Data Studio installed. Uh, I highly recommend if you do not have it or you've never heard of it, go look it up, Azure Data Studio. Download the latest version. Uh, it has a good GUI to go ahead and deploy a walkthrough uh, deployment of uh, big data clusters. Uh, that in uh, SQL Server Management Studio or SSMS, you, can, you don't see that, at least not yet. So ADS is definitely a, a, wor a, down, uh, a worth um, a, a worthwhile download. So your scale out query management is also based off of the master instance. The master instance also has a machine learning service is uh, enabled from the master instance. Now you might have uh, uh, seen from the big picture that the compute pool, all it does is computation, mainly for aggregations. If you're doing joins, you're doing a join that um, you're using a, a, a polybase to connect to an Oracle server, doing any type of joins that requires computation. The master instance decides when that it should kick that off from the master instance compute over to the compute pool instances, and then it'll go ahead and uh, relay the data, uh, the results back up to the master instance. The data pool is used for data persistence or caching. So for example, if you are, um, uh, you're selecting data out of an Oracle server, for example, but for uh, you know you don't want to keep doing that because for some reason the Oracle server is on a slow network or a slow server. You can select it once, create an external table in the d big data cluster in SQL Server, dump the data in there, and then run your selects to the external table. You don't got to you don't have to go back to the Oracle server anymore. So data pool is used primarily for data persistence or caching. You, uh, via uh, an external table if you wanted to persist it. Storage pool consists of pods that have SQL Server on Linux, Spark, and Hadoop. They are running in conjunction with each other. So this is primarily for you have your big data coming in and it's stored in your storage pool uh, with uh, processing Hadoop. So storage pool is primarily through data ingestion through Spark, data storage in HDFS or again the uh, Hadoop distributed file system uh, is spread across your source. So if you have a couple, uh, let's say a five node uh, big data cluster 
and on three of them or four of them that are worker nodes, you have the a storage pool pause distributed up against them to shard the data across those nodes just for uh, uh, persistency and availability. So a uh, data access is via uh, through the HDFS and SQL Server endpoints, and I'll show you a screenshot of that in a couple more slides. Now the one thing is we're talking about data, 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 Kubernetes, containers, pods, etc. How does storage work with Kubernetes? Now the the very neat cool thing about Kubernetes and storage is that Kubernetes doesn't really how do I say this? Doesn't really do storage, but it orchestrates it and manages it, uh, just like it does with everything else, like with with uh, with uh, you know pods and and uh, etc. So in this example, this is Azure Kubernetes service. So this is a Kubernetes version on Azure that you can that, that you can use. And in this diagram, you see this was actually taken from the uh, Azure Kubernetes Service uh, documentation site. Just to make it clear, the only thing I did was I bolded the red to stand out, and these are what I'm going to be talking about. But in general, you have your cluster master, like I mentioned, and then your node. And inside your node, you have your pod. You also have storage. Now, storage is presented to the Kubernetes cluster as a as a volume. So whether you have uh, net app or pure storage or any other storage vendor you provide that storage as a volume to the kubernetes cluster now in this case you see down here it says persistent volume now this is a type of uh, a volume class that you or storage class that you present to the kubernetes master as hey this is not just a regular volume this is a persistent volume, meaning it's hosted elsewhere. And if for some reason the pod or node dies, the storage is still going to be there because we need data persisted for database server. We need it persistent. We don't need it temporary storage where if the pod or the node was to die, the storage goes with it. We don't need that. We need a persistent. So you prov you uh, mount the volume, but you mount it. You also say in the configs that this is a persistent volume. Now you also on the other side create a persistent volume claim and that claim has a claim to the persistent volume. So if the persistent volume is, you know, a uh, amount to let's say your pure storage, your persistent volume is saying, hey, I want uh, let's say one terabyte, 500 gigabytes, whatever the storage is from this persistent volume, which is the amount to a uh, uh, your your storage your storage vendor then kubernetes matches the claim with the mount with the persistent volume is bound now your pod has a storage so whenever it needs it it has it as long as you have that persistent volume claim you have it it's kind of like if you had a ticketing system where you, if you have a tape a paper ticket for example i don't have anything oh eh, maybe i might have used this if you have this coaster for example this is your ticket so if you were to lose this ticket, you don't have access to storage. You have to create that, that binding operation again. So to tell Kubernetes that yes, this pod has uh, the access to this storage. So that's how Kubernetes works. Now, this is just the verbiage for that. Uh, I put the verbiage in here. You might find a lot of verbiage on this slide. It just in case you were to download the slide deck, you have it to look back like you don't have to just look at an image and wonder what the heck was he talking about unless you want to go and watch the whole video again. So now in terms of security, there's only five endpoints or five methods to get in to uh, uh, the uh, SQL Server big data cluster. Starting from the left side, you see the AZ data CLI. So that's a command line interface uh, developed by Microsoft. Now this allows you download this, install it. It gives you command line tool to log into the controller. And if you mention the controller, if you remember the controller was the brains of the big data cluster, excuse me. And this allows you to log in and check the health and check the status and things like that. You can do that with AZ data. Going over, you can log into Yarn or Livio Spark with the other endpoints. And then in the orange right here, let me, oh, went ahead of myself here. You see this, Orange uh, is a regular TDS SQL Server uh, connection right here. Azure Data Studio, SSMS, ODBC, 
your SQL Server master instance. So your master instance is the same SQL Server, the way you log in right now. It's the same thing. And then you can also log into your app proxy. Now all this, the, you probably, you, you got a glimpse when the uh, screen went ahead, but this is the output. A list, if, let me bring in the mouse over here very slowly so it doesn't skip anymore. <laughs> But here's, I have a, a, I'm on the master node right here on my own personal uh, lab setup at home I have. I created a three node cluster. I deployed big data clusters on it. I, down, I have the AZ data tool. Now I use the AZ data, space BDC, space endpoint, list output table command. It takes all the endpoints that you can log into and spits them out for you in this readable format, in this table format. And it, you can see right here, now I have my internal IP address that if you wanted your gateway to access, you know, HDFS files in Spark or Spark JAWS management, you have this IP address right here with the port 30443. Uh, if you wanted to go to port 30778, you get your application proxy, your management proxy is 777. Now your Kibana and Grafana are here, 777, but four slash one is Kibana, one is Grafana. Now, all I gotta do is I gotta copy this, put it in my browser, hit enter, and I log into Kibana, which is a wealth of logs. I mean, this is the most, it's so much information there, you don't, you probably don't even know what to do with it. But more, the more the merrier, right? And then you have Grafana right below that, you log into that, a wealth of metrics information. I mean, you can customize this left and right. I mean, I'm working on a video to actually look into Kibana and Grafana from the uh, DBA standpoint or from the data professional. See, you know, kind of, well, what is Grafana and Grafana? But I'm working on that. That's a wealth of information. Uh, the most important thing that you will need is right here. This third one from the bottom, uh, comma 31433. This endpoint is your SQL Server master instance. So if I take this, and I log into uh, uh, SSMS or Azure Data Studio, I can connect. And it'll be just like I'm logging in SQL, a regular SQL Server. That's what I use. Now, I can use, uh, if you're wondering, well, can you do it as a uh, uh, DNS using your, your domain name? You can. As a SQL Server, which you actually could deploy a SQL Server a Big Data Cluster on uh, uh, your Active Directory domain. But as of CU5, which came out a couple of days ago, a week ago, you can actually deploy multiple big data clusters on a single Active Directory domain, which is pretty cool. So those are the endpoints. This is all just verbiage. Just make sure I'm good on time. That's good. Now, features. This, this is interesting because the one feature, the single feature that really got me uh, interested so much so that I got off of my lazy butt on the couch watching Netflix, yeah. <laughs> was this feature right here, data virtualization. So Microsoft calls data virtualization, which is the concept of grabbing data from all different sources using Polybase and creating this hub or this virtualized layer of all these different data sources that you can query. This really, uh, I started to see the 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 quote unquote light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, I, I started to see, wow, this is big. Now, if you're wondering, well, can't you have data virtualization with just polybase? Do you, you don't even need big data clusters for that? You're right. You can do polybase and and create this data virtualization, this data hub. But the icing on the cake and then the cherry on top uh, is the fact that you can actually do it integrated with Spark and Hadoop. So it starts to become this big mo monolith, this type of, again, going back to that image of the artificial intelligence machine learning platform, that's what it becomes. So that, that to me is just amazing. You could actually process and do all that. So uh, this, of course, you have your data lake. You have your data lake, your data virtualization, you have all these streams coming in, it can store it in the storage pool. You have your data lake, do anything with data mart. You can divide them all out. You have your silos of, of, of data professionals, your developers, your DBAs, your data scientists, your data analysts, whatever, coming in 
and working with their own little little section of data. That that's to me just still mind blowing, and I'm still trying to wrap my head around this whole technology, and it's very very exciting. So. Now, one thing I, I want to say, and uh, hopefully for people that are watching this overseas, is maybe early in the morning for you. Hopefully, I don't put you to sleep. And the probably toughest thing is me trying to stay awake at you know 11:30, 11:40 at night, is talking about BDC licensing, SQL Server licensing, big yawn. You know, <laughs> uh, if you've ever worked with licensing, some of the most convoluted, confusing stuff ever. But I just took out some of the basics uh, for uh, BDC. So let's let's get started. Now the master instance for BDC licensing, the master instance has to be core licenses. Uh, the enterprise based licenses are right there. Um, and you must have software assurance or subscription. Now what does that mean software assurance? The benefit of software assurance is that it provides you a big data node entitlement. Or that's what Microsoft calls it. The BDN core entitlement for SQL Server big data clusters at a cost of $400 per year. Now, what the heck does all that mean? I'll give you an example. Now, here is enterprise licensing. You have a four core master uh, instance. Now you have enterprise licensing, you have software assurance. As a result of this, you have your four cores and your master, you get eight times whatever your master core is. You get that much as entitlement or they quote unquote give that to you so you can use that divvy that up against storage pool compute pool whatever other cores that you have running in your instances and the rest you just have to subscribe four hundred dollars a year for two core pack so again enterprise licensing eight times entitlement cores for whatever number of cores you have on your master instance what about standard Standard is the same other than just one time. So instead of eight times, it's one time. So in this case, same scenario, you have four core master, four times one because it's standard, you get an additional four, and then you have to subscribe to 44 cores. That's the difference between enterprise and standard. Uh, in terms of Azure, they have license mobility. So all that means is if you have uh, whatever you have on-prem, you can quote unquote lift shift and use it on Azure. Now, that is a wrap for the uh, overview of it. The learning curve is steep. I'm going to tell you that I'm still learning. Of course, we learn every day. And as they say, the more we learn, the, the more we learn, the more we realize how much we don't know. But I implore you, I beg you, don't give up and uh, keep going. So I'm going to leave you with a learning path. And this is a place that you can go to and, and learn more about it. And you find my contact information and all that there. And there's countless of people I can't even count that email me and say, hey, I got this problem deploying this and that. We go back and forth via LinkedIn or email or Twitter and I help them out. So the call to action to you is go to mohammedarab.com forward slash BDC. You can download this session and a list of blog posts and videos. If you're if you're on YouTube, you can catch me on uh, YouTube. I have a channel you can subscribe and whenever there's a new video you get you get a sent to your inbox, a learning path BDC checklist, Excel checklist, download that for Linux containers and Kubernetes. So these are websites that I learn things from and I have them in that Excel checklist books, websites. Some of them are free. Some of them are paid. Uh, a lot of cool playgrounds you can actually learn online, things like that. So you just go to mohammedrob.com forward slash BDC. You got everything there for you. If you got any questions, reach out to me. One big thank you I want to say, and you're probably wondering, what the hell is a gift? I want to know what the surprise is. Well, I'm going to leave you with this. And uh, I was honored a couple months ago. I was asked to be a technical reviewer for this book right here, SQL Server. Big Data Clusters by Benjamin Weissman and Enrico uh, Vandelar. And as a gift to you, you go right here, bit.ly forward slash free BDC book, put in your email and you'll be in the running. At the end of July, maybe the first week, getting into August, I will pick a random person and I will mail you the book. Actually, this, this, this book right here, I'll mail it to you and then 
it'll hopefully encourage you to go down the path, further encourage you um, to go down the path of uh, learning about big data clusters. And most importantly, don't forget your sweat equity in what you already know. And learning something like Linux, containers, and Kubernetes, you're going to be set for years to come, especially with Kubernetes. Kubernetes takes a lot of effort to fully understand, and it's just a wealth of information there for you to learn. So bit.ly forward slash free BDC book, sign up, and then I will pick somebody at the end. I'll reach out to you. I'll give you a couple of days to reply. If you don't reply, I'm going to go down to the next person because I usually get a lot of people. That, I did this in the month of June. I got a lot of people that signed up and then uh, I gave the one person a couple of days and then reply back. I got to do justice to the other folk and I just keep going down the, the line until somebody replies. So that's that. And I will say a big thank you. Uh, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter if you if you're there. Connect on Twitter, MohammedDarab.com on a blog. And thank you so much uh, for, for joining and participating in this massive event. This is actually my very first time presenting at 11 p.m. at night and part of this amazing uh, platform. So big thank you to the organizers. And if you please leave some feedback for myself right there, you can uh, 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 scan that QR, uh, QR code right there and the event. So I do really appreciate that the uh, moderator can take over from here. Thank you so much.